Good afternoon, everybody. I'm David Bessemer. I'm the Chief Technology Officer with Composite Software. And I recognize that as the anchor in this day, I'm the only thing that stands between you and cocktail hour. So we'll keep it crisp. Um, and, and when I'm finished, I'd be happy to answer questions. Uh, but then I'll also be happy to stick around here or be out in the uh, atrium to answer more questions. So feel free to buttonhole me and, and uh, talk about data virtualization. So. Um, one of the things that, first of all, I love this day because it's our customers who stand up here and talk about their experiences with data virtualization. And hopefully those of you who are new to data virtualization, that becomes a nice way for you to learn about it and also gain some confidence that people are getting real value out of data virtualization in their enterprises. Because after all, that's really the, uh, the crux of it, is if you feel like you can get real value out of this in the projects that you're working on, then you might consider using it. So earlier today, uh, we talked about the problem with um, change, is that change is hard. And you uh, uh, saw um, Rick Vanderlands put up a, a picture of a clipper ship with nice billowing sails and talked about how, why would we want to change that? Right? The, the ships are working fine, getting our cargo from A to B. And then he juxtaposed that with the modern aircraft carrier. So somewhere along the line, somebody decided that the uh, billowing sails of the clipper ship were not quite enough to achieve whatever they were going to achieve. And if you think about it, it wasn't abstraction or encapsulation or um, the efficiency of a steam engine or anything that would actually move you from a sail ship to a power ship. What it was, was some compelling need that actually caused somebody to finally decide to employ a power-based ship versus a sailing-based ship. Right? Think about the trade routes back then. You'd go from Europe to Africa to the Caribbean, up the east coast of North America, and back to Europe. And you had to do that with a sailing vessel. Well, when somebody finally figured out that it was much more cost-effective to take tobacco directly from Virginia to Europe and then go back to Virginia and get some more, you couldn't do that very easily with a sailing ship, so there was a compelling business reason. So you need to find that same reason in your enterprise for motivating change. Right? So one of the things I'm going to talk about today is what's different now. If you've been looking at data virtualization for a couple of years, we've been looking at it for 10 years at Composite Software, what's different now than, say, three or four years ago? And I think that that's really the change that is happening now that's going to compel people to start doing uh, different approaches to data integration and data management. So my agenda today is simple. Let's talk about how some of these changes are breaking traditional integration paradigms. Because those changes are going to be driving uh, your decisions and, and your workload over the next few years. Uh, so then, as we'll see, data virtualization right now is considered part of uh, data integration market and oftentimes people compare it to ETL as an alternative to ETL but that's actually just the tip of the iceberg um, data virtualization is actually evolving into a much bigger market data management and that's where the data warehouse sits that's where data mart sit a lot of other technologies sit in there and you'll see how that evolution is occurring as I talk about the logical data warehouse and finally I thought I would talk about some paths to success so that you can at the end of this day, if you like what you've heard from some of our customers, think about how you might start to introduce data virtualization into your company and start to get some value out of it. Okay, okay so let's start with how uh, big data analytics and cloud computing are breaking some of the paradigms that have been working well for us for a long time, uh, because they are breaking them. And, and that's going to be the compelling push. So a couple of industry trends, first of all. On the right, you see that data management uh, investment is growing about 14% a year. Pretty modest investment growth, but still healthy. But over on the left, big data and cloud delivery are getting much stronger investment. They're growing much faster than data management as a whole. And by the way, when I say big data, you should think analytics. Right? It's not about the data. It's not actually even about the analytics. It's about the results. Right? How can I make my business run more efficiently by taking this big data, combining it with some other data, doing some analytics to achieve some insights that get rolled out and operationalized such that I can beat my competitors? Right? That's what it's about. So 
Uh, so big data, whatever you want to call it, it's really about the results you can achieve by harnessing that data. Same thing with cloud, by the way. Um, people talk about going to the cloud. Why do you want to go to the cloud? Again, it all comes back to the economics. If it's cheaper, faster, more elastic, allows me to run my business better. Okay? Nobody wants to go to the cloud because of its an abstracted architecture or um, it allows me to use some technology that's really cool. Right? It's all about the business benefit. That's what it comes back to. So what's driving all of these is the fact that if you don't do these, your competitors will have an advantage. That's really what it is. And as you look around the room today, if you see some people who are using data virtualization in your market and you're not yet using data virtualization, that should concern you a little bit. Okay? Because it's about using the latest tools to achieve whatever business result you need to achieve to serve your customers. Okay, this is another uh, industry trend chart. This is IBM's global CIO survey from 2011. And a couple of the bars I've circled there. First, let's talk about the one in the middle. The interest in cloud computing went from 33% in 2009 to 60% in 2011, almost doubled. So obviously, that's got a really strong trend to it as far as interest and therefore investment. Uh, the one on the left, business intelligence and analytics lumped together. First of all, it started out high, uh, and it remained high, but it doesn't look like it changed much. But the truth is, if you go back and look at the emphasis in 2009, it was all about business intelligence and getting your reports right and your infrastructure and your data warehouse, et cetera. But in 2011 and now, it's much more about analytics. So instead of looking what happened, right, what went on in my business, which is more the business intelligence and reporting, it's about what's going to happen based on the data that I have and how I can analyze it. Okay, so again, it looks unchanged, but it's actually analytics is growing much faster. And you see that on this Forrester slide where this essentially is tracking interest, uh, current utilization, interest in, and intent to use a certain technology. And you see down there at the bottom that real-time predictive business and customer analytics is the fastest uh, growing segment on this slide. Okay. So again, you have to think about change in interest and change in investment and momentum behind these, not so much current investment. Obviously, there's still a lot of investment in even the ones that are declining here, but analytics for uh, achieving business results and insights is really the, the one that has the most interest. So with that, why is this breaking how we currently do things? So this could be a picture of your world in the most ideal sense. Right? You have a single data warehouse, and you have some consumers of that data, and life is clean and simple. And in fact, this has been the goal for about 20 years, maybe 25. And, and a lot of people actually are just getting around to building data warehouses, and it's still a reasonable goal for part of the problem. Um, and, and why is it a reasonable goal? Because it gave you one place to go to get a business view of the data. Right? So not the transactional data, not you know some uh, weird log data, but this was a business view of the data and it was a single place to go, and still is. But it's getting harder and harder to achieve that. Right? Now, if you were able to achieve this today, and people have achieved uh, some level of success with this over the last 20 years, it actually gave you pretty good agility in the business. You could do the reports you wanted to do, you could do the um, uh, compliance you needed to do, and it all came from one place. Right? Now, the reason that that agility meter isn't higher is nobody actually would ever label a data warehouse as being agile. Right? It's very brittle, uh, very heavyweight. But what I'm talking about is the business value, is if this was possible, you would actually have pretty good agility. Um, the problem is almost immediately after you create this, your business comes and tells you, look, not all the data I need for my reporting is in the warehouse, and I need transactional data from various applications and sources. So you all saw this happen, right? It happened right before your eyes that you, you got somebody's data mart all set up the way you wanted it to be set up, and then they needed some data that was in some other system. And this wasn't easy, because some of these other systems were like SAP that had sort of non-standard BAPI interfaces that you had to try to figure out how to migrate that data. And, and of course, transactional data has this impedance mismatch with what's in the warehouse as being aggregated data and summarized data. So, but as data management and integration and IT professionals, we figured this out, right? And, and this is kind of the state that we ran with for maybe 10 years, 
right? And we figured it out, and we sort of got change data capture involved, and maybe some messaging and some EAI, and we kind of <laughs> kept, kept the fingers in the dike and a little chewing gum such that the warehouse still remained the focus of data integration. But things changed again, right? So somewhere along the line, somebody in your company said, hey, I need to do some analytics, and I'm going to go buy an Atiza appliance or I'm going to go buy a Vertica database and install it and just start doing it. They didn't even ask, or they had their own money, and it was important enough to that segment of the business to go and install that technology because it was a fit-for-purpose analytic appliance that served their need better than anything else they could get their hands on in the company. Okay? And so the emergence of these analytic appliances over the last five to eight years has started to create islands of data outside of the warehouse. Likewise, cloud-based computing. Uh, if you think about how Salesforce started to penetrate companies, it wasn't that somebody said, we should do some cloud-based computing. It was that somebody said, hey, I don't want to use Siebel because it's going to cost me a million and a half dollars to get started. I'm going to use Salesforce.com because it cost me a hundred dollars to get started. And they started doing that, and pretty soon they had a dozen people using it, and then 50 and 100 people. And suddenly, Salesforce.com became the standard for how you interacted with your Salesforce and managed what they were doing. But by doing that, you ended up with data in the cloud. A lot of data, and really important data. Data that you would want to report on with the data that was in your warehouse. Maybe even with the data that was in your analytic appliance. Right? And, and there, there's no good solution to this problem because in the old, sort of the, the, the cracked version of this that was early, you'd say, well, you know, with ETL, I can still get it all into the warehouse or I can do some change data capture and get it where I need it. But the last thing you want to do is take data that's out in the cloud and pull it back inside your enterprise. It's out there. It's a good place for it. Leave it there. Manage it there. And same thing with these analytic appliances. The last thing you want to do is move all of that data into your warehouse. So now you have a problem that's more difficult to solve using the traditional data integration paradigms and data management paradigms. But you still need to solve it, right? So it's not that you can put your hands in your ears and say, la, 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 we don't need to look at those other sources out there. The business is going to compel you to create data streams that include all of these sources. Now, of course, this isn't the end of it. You see I have a little white space there left on the edges. Um, we all invested in the concept of service-oriented architectures, uh, say, four, five, six years ago, and um, weren't sure we got the value out of them. But what's happened now in the last few years is that people are starting to get value out of services, especially as they move to REST-based services, especially as the technologies have evolved to be easier to use, and especially as you have to interact with more business partners that are out on the public internet. So web services are, have finally started to become a real part of your data integration challenge. And then what's this thing over on the right, right? Big data, no SQL, you've heard all the terms. And is there a really good reason to use these? Absolutely. Can you use it for everything? No, <laughs> right? So if you, if you hear about people, well, I'm doing away with my data warehouse and I'm going to put everything in Hadoop, right? That's not going to happen. But there are things that it's really good at, right? If you've got a bunch of exhaust data coming out of mobile phones or uh, click streams off of your website, it's a great dumping ground, right? It's cheap, it scales, um, you, can, you can sort of warehouse all of that exhaust data until you need to use it. Secondly, in order to actually use that data, you need to digest it in some way. And MapReduce is a really interesting way to do parallel processing on very large sets of data. So between the value of a cheap place to dump some data and the interesting way to process data using MapReduce, that system, Hadoop and others like it, are here to stay. Right? They're not going away, and there are reasons that you should be leveraging those as part of your data management architecture. So this is, this is the new normal. This genie isn't going back in the bottle. Right? We, we kind of were able to push it back in when it was just transactional sources and just applications. But this is not, we can't get this back in the bottle. You have to deal with this reality. And if that wasn't enough, along comes mobile devices. We all used to sit at our desktops, pull up our reports in the morning, and everything was good. Now you need to deliver data on tablets and smartphones 
and you need to deliver data on multiple different kinds of computers to multiple different partners, et cetera. So this idea of bringing your own device and having to distribute data to lots of different places further complicates the data integration challenge. Okay. So in this new normal, this is what's compelling change. Now, as I said, you can ignore this for a while, and, and, and the changes happen gradually over the last 10 years, but now your business needs this data, needs it to be integrated, and needs you to be able to respond to their needs, and that's what's compelling you to do something different. So as you contemplate something different, what you'll find is that data virtualization starts to reestablish the original goals for that physical data warehouse, which is it's one logical place to go to get data, and it is a business view of the data. In fact, it may be even a better business view of the data because of its agility and its iterative nature. You can actually achieve a closer match to what the data should be than you could when you were doing it physically. So by introducing data virtualization into your data management mix, you start to get back to the idea that I can access all of my data, I can get uh, visibility into every part of my business, whether it's for compliance or risk or just planning, and I can do that without having to uh, rip and replace all of these physical systems that have been built up over the years. So if you think about this, it's, it's actually not rocket science, right? It, it, it makes sense. It's what we do whenever we um, need new approaches to things as we start to abstract and start to uh, create um, uh, separation from the old world. Um, Java did that with a Java virtual machine. Uh, our uh, VMware did that with our physical machines. Data virtualization is doing that with our physical data silos. So there's, there's nothing that should make you think that this is odd and unusual. It's an evolution of data management. Um, the challenge, of course, is getting comfortable with that idea and getting comfortable with the idea that you need to change. Okay. So, so as you look at this picture, you heard customers today talking about this. So it's one thing to have me stand up here and uh, talk about you doing this, but it's a much different thing to have analysts and customers talk about their successes with it. So that's why we much prefer to present you with that. But it is somewhat instructive to look at what other people are calling this and kind of orient you in the industry here. So uh, Forrester, analyst firm, uh, for several years called this information as a service. Uh, they actually changed the name of their uh, information as a service wave to data virtualization last year. So Forrester actually now calls this data virtualization just like we do. Gartner has a long-term vision for what they call the logical data warehouse. They actually sort of call data virtualization data federation still today. Um, we think that's different and I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. But their, their long-term vision for where this is headed and for that picture that I drew on the previous page is called a logical data warehouse. And we actually agree very much with their idea of what this means to data warehousing. Um, and, and that evolution is going to occur over a number of years with new technologies and new approaches to data management, and data virtualization is a key part of that. I put a couple of other independent analysts that are quite familiar with this, Sean Rogers and Colin White up here, just to tell you that you may hear some different names for this as you start to read about it more and, and evaluate whether it's right for your business. Um, but, uh, but everybody is now in agreement that the data warehouse is no longer the single focus for data integration. It can't be you need to employ additional methodologies that allow you to marshal data in a variety of ways, including the data in your warehouse and in your data marts and other places. Okay. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the logical data warehouse because this talk is about the future. Right? Today we know we have data virtualization functionality and as that evolves, it will evolve into something that looks like uh, Gartner's vision for logical data warehouse. So. Uh, it's actually somewhat serendipitous that just last week a uh, new paper was published by Gartner. This was actually after I created these slides. Uh, the logical data warehouse will be a key scenario for using data federation. Okay? So again, data federation, data virtualization, I'll talk about the differences here in a minute. But, 
But the point is, if you're a Gartner uh, customer, subscriber, you can go get this paper and several others on the Logical Data Warehouse and start to understand their vision for where this is going and how data virtualization is a key enabler for the Logical Data Warehouse. So what, is, what are the drivers for the Logical Data Warehouse? Well, I talked a little bit about fit-for-purpose data stores like Natiza. And if you look at the red, some solution designs simply should be different now with new technologies and new approaches. Okay? It's just you have to do something different. Uh, as far as big data, new asset types are not always best served by deploying a repository-only solution. Right? Again, if you've got all this exhaust data, um, terabytes of it, it really doesn't make sense for you to move it into your warehouse. You may want to try to get insights from that right now from the raw data. And finally, self-service. This is an interesting thing. Right? We haven't talked a lot about self-service today. We had a little bit of discussion during the panel. But self-service is a big and emerging trend that data is going to have to live up to. And end users are embracing self-service BI and analytics. Um, a lot of this is being driven by younger, uh, newer, uh, uh, entrance into the workforce who grew up with technology, grew up having um, uh, data at their fingertips, and, and they're not willing to um, uh, compromise on what data they get and when they get it. So they just want to go do it themselves, and they're very oriented towards self-service, and we as IT professionals should respond to that and enable that, and that's part of the Logical Data Warehouse vision. So this is Gartner's seven uh, components that are part of a logical data warehouse. And uh, you can see down at the bottom are sort of the data-oriented boxes. And then up at the top, we have uh, the ability to locate some data. Um, I'm going to do a little overlay here to do a little translation, because um, data virtualization has, currently has functionality in almost all of these areas and will continue to expand as we grow to become a logical data warehouse uh, provider. Um, so it's, it's, it'll be helpful for you as you start to hear more about the logical data warehouse as to what this means today and how data virtualization might evolve into this. So first of all, in the lower left, you have repository management. That's a generic term for your current data warehouse, data marts, operational data stores, et cetera. Okay? And that'll stay blue because we're not, we're not going to do that, right? Oracle, IBM, Teradata, Natiza, they all have that market covered. That's not our business. Over on the right, you have distributed processing. Really? It's Hadoop, <laughs> right? It's MapReduce. Now, eventually, there will be some other ones, and, and somebody will innovate something over the next few years that is like Hadoop and, and employs MapReduce and maybe some other innovative techniques. But the point is, today, if you think about these boxes, think about that as the Hadoop box. And it's an important box, as I said. Now, data virtualization, you can see that it's in a box down here, kind of uh, sequestered in the bottom layer, and, and we have continuous discussions with Gartner about this. Um, we think that's the data federation box, not the data virtualization box. And so I'm going to change the name of that to data federation. Why is that? Right? Why, do, why do I believe that that's a limited view of data virtualization? Well, federation is the idea that you can combine data from multiple sources and do a join. Right, that's sort of the traditional classic definition of federation. And it's an important piece of functionality. And it's a piece of functionality that data virtualization does very well. But federation isn't the only thing virtualization does. It also abstracts. It creates a business layer. It decouples. It provides caching. There's a lot of other things that virtualization does. And so it's, it's, uh, we don't want to limit it to just data federation. The ands and the ors there that you see are really what federation accomplishes when it puts a layer above all of your sources, including Hadoop, including your data warehouse and your data marts. So from a data federation standpoint, your data layer where you actually optimize and, and access data sort of looks like this. As you start to move up the layers, um, this is where, uh, and by the way, data virtualization covers all of this uh, that I've just talked about really well today. Right? Very full functionality. But I do want to make a distinction that as we move up the line and implement a full logical data warehouse, there's still some things we have to do. Right? And we will continue to do that. But as I describe our direction as a company to you, that's where we're aligned. Right? We're not going to go do unstructured text search. We're not going to go over here and do, um, uh, uh, we're going to you know, become a data quality company. Those aren't our expertises. Our expertise is creating a logical, 
view of your data. And as a result, we are very well aligned with this idea of a logical data warehouse. So as I go up the line here, I want to talk about some things we do today, but some things we may do in the future. So SLA management, well, if you think about that today, it's quite a bit about query planning and execution to make sure that you meet the needs. We can probably throw caching in here. And we do a lot of those things really well today. But there's some things we don't do today. SLA management may be based on policy. Maybe you should go after one data source during these hours and another data source during these hours. Maybe the, uh, the whether you've met this SLA or not should be driven by who the user is, that it's a user-based SLA policy. Those kind of policies and more advanced, um, almost heuristic SLA management is something that will be part of a logical data warehouse. It's not necessarily something that is there today in data virtualization. Auditing and performance evaluation, monitoring and governance. Um, and if you think about visibility into how your system is operating, you need to understand what it's doing and who's doing it. Who's using these, this data? How are they using this data? How is it performing? How is it interacting with the other systems? We do a lot of this today. We've got a monitor that helps you get visibility into your runtime cluster, et cetera. But there's also more that we will continue to do in the future. Um, governance, just like other forms of um, new approaches to data stewardship, governance is on the rise. And the reason governance is on the rise is because of compliance and auditing and privacy and things that you need to uh, do in order to make sure you are abiding by the law and protecting the privacy of your customers. So governance, though, is not a platform. It is not a single technology. It's people, processes, and technology to support whatever they are. So as we look at governance as a part of the data virtualization platform and eventually as part of the logical data warehouse, what we do is we look at what functionality is needed to help you implement the governance that you need in order to comply with regulations and rules that you have inside of your company. Okay. So we will continue to build out functionality there to enable that. Taxonomy, ontology, resolution, that sounds like a really expensive thing. Um, and uh, that's part of why it's uh, a, written for a two to five year roadmap with, with Gartner. Um, we actually see this as kind of the um, curated view of your business's data. And when I say curated, what I mean is this is how you actually want to look at your business in terms of data objects, canonicals, whatever you want to call them. And, and this is one of the things that as you move from physical integration to virtual data integration opens up for you. You get to actually define these canonicals the way you hoped to have them defined originally, but they just aren't. And that decoupling and that abstraction, here we go with that word again, allows you to create a business view catalog that looks a lot more like how you want to run your business than how it might physically be integrated. We do a ton of this today as part of data virtualization, but what's one big thing we don't do today? This isn't a business user interface today. Right? There isn't a, a sort of curated catalog that a business user can go and browse things and, and find data to use for self-service, um, analysts who might want to do self-service. There isn't a business face on this today. This is still an IT face, very much like your schemas in your warehouses are IT faces. So you can see that as being an area that we're going to invest in and come out with even more tools that are much more self-service focused, probably more business focused to help IT uh, serve that need for self-service. Okay. Metadata management over there on the left. Um, it's interesting as an uh, observer of history in IT how certain things come in waves and, and come and go as to whether that's the focus or something else is the focus. Uh, metadata management for a while was the focus of you need to buy a metadata management system. But then over time it sort of waned and people realized, well, Metadata is sort of a byproduct of something I really want to accomplish. Right? I need to use metadata, and I will create metadata as part of doing whatever that thing is. But it necess doesn't necessarily have to be the focus of what I'm doing. What I want to do is I want to create a curated business view catalog. And what I want to do is I want to create um, uh, uh, reports and objects that, that give the business the insights they need. And yeah, metadata supports all of that. Okay. So we do a lot of metadata management, but not 
so much for metadata management's sake as a front and center, but as a byproduct of everything we do. And that metadata um, is part of a repository that sits inside the data virtualization layer and is, and is the, uh, uh, the artifacts that are part of all of the work you do as part of data integration uh, through virtualization. Okay. So, so this is sort of the overlay on the logical data warehouse, and, and we think that uh, Gartner's got a lot of it right. Uh, we continue to have discussions with them about um, some of the ideas that we have that might be a little bit different than theirs. They're very open to that, but I think in general, this is where data management is moving. So you saw some, uh, some of our customers today talk about some of the things they're doing. What's interesting about the logical data warehouse is we have customers today who have implemented early versions of a logical data warehouse. And when I say early versions, they will continue to evolve them over the next several years. So I wanted to talk about a few of those because there's some unique things about each one of them. Okay. So uh, this is a New York Stock Exchange. And if you were here a, a couple of years ago, you may have seen Emil Ware speak at this forum. And what's interesting about this is that big thing that looks like a warehouse in the middle called Torca. Um, trades, orders, reports, quotes, cancels, admins. Uh, it actually is, in their minds, a warehouse. It's where they take all of these sources on the bottom and bring them together so that you can use all of that data together. But what they did right from the beginning is they implemented that as a virtual warehouse or as a virtual store. And that virtual store, now you think about it, they didn't eliminate traditional data integration and data management here, what they did is they extended it to use virtualization to implement something they really wanted to do. They still do a lot of ETL to move data from these raw transactional systems up into these curated uh, systems for each silo, trades, orders, cancels, etc. But what they didn't want to do and didn't feel like they actually could do because it wasn't the right thing for their business was to integrate all of that yet again into a warehouse. So instead, they implemented a virtual version of that, and they've been running with this for several years now and are very happy with the results they get. They've got lots of different applications that run on top of this that might normally run on top of a data warehouse. Okay? So very advanced thinking several years ago. Um, by the way, as I go through these, if you're new to data virtualization, you don't, I, you don't need to panic that you, you don't have this yet. Um, new York Stock Exchange has been using data virtualization for many years now, and they evolved to this picture just like some of the other pictures I'm going to show you. They didn't start out with the Big Bang and boil the ocean and say, I'm going to create a logical data warehouse. What they did is they started using data virtualization and they evolved to this as part of their architecture. If you were here last year, you may have seen Mark Morgan speak from Qualcomm. And um, I don't have an architecture up here because for this example, it's not about the architecture. It's about timely delivery. They were getting thrashed. Mark runs the uh, enterprise architecture solutions and specifically all of the BI delivery for Qualcomm. And they were getting thrashed by all of the requests for reports and data sets. And they decided to implement a layer, a data virtualization layer. They'd already been using uh, data virtualization for a while on a couple of projects. They decided to implement a layer for all of their delivery of data sets for business intelligence. And it looks a lot like a data warehouse. And the compelling fact here is that they delivered 24 projects in two years. Right? I mean, if you think about that, with traditional data integration methodologies, we deliver maybe what? Four? Is that optimistic? Right? Six? Right? 24 data integration projects in two years by putting data virtualization in the mix and creating essentially a logical data warehouse layer as part of their architecture. Um, this is a s screenshot from a video that's on our website if you want to go hear more from Mark on how they did it and kind of what they were thinking when they did it. This is a very large energy company. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about this one, uh, again, you've got sources at the bottom, uh, use cases at the top, and in the middle you have data virtualization and what starts to look like a log logical data warehouse. But there's two interesting things about this use case. One is they evolved from a few projects to almost 500 canonical definitions in this curated business view catalog that they now run their entire 
uh, gas well processing business on. In other words, they have defined their business based on these canonicals. So as a new project comes along, they don't need to build anything new. Right? They may need to do a little remapping here and there to make it right for this particular consumer, but their whole business is defined as part of these canonicals, and they didn't do it all at once. They didn't all get in a conference room and say, we need to define a schema for our business in the form of 500 canonicals, and we need to get everybody to agree ahead of time, right? which is how you end up having to do it if you're building a warehouse. What they did is they started building projects and they started with maybe a dozen canonicals and then they had to change a few of them and eventually they got to 20 canonicals right and then maybe they got to 50 and over time they evolved and they iterated to a very steady state in their architecture that has these canonicals as part of their uh, data management architecture now okay. the second thing they did is they turned and, and you heard um, uh, Wayne talk about this this morning they turned this notion of performance and SLA management on its head right sitting in this room today almost every one of you who doesn't use data virtualization today has probably said to yourself is this thing gonna perform right it looks really cool but is it gonna perform am I gonna be able to meet my SLA needs what they what what this company said is that's plumbing right? That's strategies that have nothing to do with delivering the right data. So they put this virtual layer above all of their data, and then they said, if it doesn't perform, we'll materialize it. We'll physically consolidate it. But the consumers of the data don't know whether it's physically consolidated or not, and don't care. So you see that Natiza box over there on the right? They will deliver all these canonicals. This is how they built it up. They delivered every canonical virtually, and the moment they didn't feel like that canonical data set was delivering the SLA, was meeting the SLA that those consumers needed, they would cash it. They'd cash it into Natiza. They would materialize it. Right? And you say, well, okay, that's interesting. But it's an important distinction is that you change how you think about this. You don't say, well, should I virtualize or should I consolidate? What you say is, I want to virtualize so that I'm decoupled, abstracted, and I can deliver with agility. I can deliver quickly business value. And then you figure out how do I meet SLAs by potentially doing some consolidation using ETL, maybe doing some caching using the data virtualization layer. But at that point, you get to decide as the IT and data management professional, well, how do I deliver this without having to think about, oh, and by the way, while I'm trying to figure out how to architect for delivery, I have to lay that over the the, the schema in the data warehouse and so now I've got to create a new one because it doesn't quite match and it, you can separate those problems okay? and that's the compelling thing about this version this early version of a logical data warehouse is that they virtualize everything and then they consolidate when they must to meet SLAs okay pretty interesting architecture okay last one I want to show you is uh, Putnam Investments and What's interesting about this one is if you look at the top there, three out of four of those are about analytics. And remember when I started my talk, I said that what's driving uh, the change here is big data, analytics, cloud computing. If you look up at the top there, you have analytics. You look in the middle, they call it an analytic data hub. And what do you have down at the bottom? You have sort of your normal sources enterprise sources that we would consider to be traditional but over on the left you have two sources that are based in the cloud and almost over to the right you have a Hadoop cluster so in order for them to do the analysis that they want to do which by the way is about um, customer behavior and churn and um, uh, predictability uh, about their customers in order to actually do that analytics they need the data from the cloud and they need the data from their Hadoop cluster. Can't do it without it. And they're not gonna ETL all that into a warehouse. There's just no way, right? So for them, the analysis that they wanted to achieve was compelling enough for them to put data virtualization over this. Now, I should mention, this wasn't their first use case, right? Just like I said, everybody sort of evolves to this as they get comfortable with it. Their first use case was about rogue data marts, right? People who had a bunch of data sources essentially on their desktop and the way they wanted to combat that was try to pull those back in as virtual marts and that was really effective for them. But then they evolved to this as a second 
very important use case for their business and essentially created a logical data warehouse for analytics. Okay, so hopefully throughout the day, not from me, but from our customers and some of the analysts, you've heard some things about data virtualization that might compel you to give it a try. So because of that, I thought I would just take a couple of minutes here at the end and talk about some proven paths to success. So first thing is, this evolves. Over the last 10 years, we've seen several different uh, use cases for data uh, virtualization. As I said, Federation's kind of the simple uh, original case that many people start with uh, for achieving some reporting that they couldn't necessarily do uh, without virtually integrating. Uh, another very common case uh, is what we call data warehouse extension, where you have a data warehouse, it doesn't quite have everything in it, but you've got some needs to deliver data to the business, so if you layer virtualization over the top of it, you can not only get some agility in your data management practice, but you can satisfy the business need right away. Okay, so we've seen these two as very early um, and frequent use cases where people enter using data virtualization. So look for these in your business. Um, as people use these on one or two projects and eventually get to three or four projects, then they start to think about putting a shared layer over all of their data sources. And again, this could be a very thin layer right now. Maybe it's a somewhat truncated layer. But at that point, it's about flexibility. Multiple data sources, multiple consumers of data. Okay. Now, one of the trends that's current and, and sort of fast and furious is analytics. And this is being driven not only by what's the analytic, but all the big data, et cetera. So those are kind of drivers on the bottom there. Um, you saw that Putnam's latest use case, which looks more like a logical data warehouse for analytics, is really driving their current usage. You know, they're several years in, but this is definitely an area where data virtualization can serve the needs of analysts as you start to look at um, how to use them. And then as we go out and get a little bit lighter, logical data warehouses on the horizon, uh, we think this is, again, we have customers who are doing this today, but for those of you who are coming to data virtualization now, this is an evolution over the next several years. And uh, you'll see companies like IBM and Teradata start to promote this. IBM already does promote this idea of a logical data warehouse. But in order to actually achieve logical data warehouse and have a comprehensive data layer, you're going to need data virtualization. Uh, this is a book that uh, Composite put together that is 10 in-depth case studies from our customers. And some of the customers I talked about today are in here. So uh, we are domain experts because we've worked with all these customers. They are domain experts, and we can put you in touch with them. If, if you want to learn more about how they did it for their particular part of the business. Um, I think at the end of the day today, you get to get uh, uh, this book or Rick Vanderland's book. They're both great, okay? Uh, Rick Vanderland's is obviously a domain expert, and he knows a lot about data virtualization. So get one of the books, read it. When you're finished, get the other book. And finally, this is important. Earlier we talked about, well, how do I go to the business and say, I need some money to buy some data virtualization? And Essentially what Peter said is, or I, I think it was Marty said, I don't go to the business and talk about data virtualization. I go to the business and talk about something that they need. They need time to solution, right? Instead of six months, they need it in six weeks. Right? They need data that they couldn't get access to prior to this, right? They want to do some analytics and they can't get access to the right data to do it. Find one of those and then self-fund your investment in data virtualization by uh, creating that project in a new way that provides value to the business immediately. The three of these are up here because they're good examples of how they self-funded their first investment in data virtualization. I think if you talk to almost any one of our customers, the ROI case for their first project was compelling. And again, it's usually because doing it the alternative way was either going to take five times as long or it wasn't going to be possible. Those are compelling. Right? If I can deliver this in six weeks instead of six months, that's compelling. If I can deliver data to the business where they say, holy cow, I've never been able to see that data before, that's compelling. They don't care whether it's virtualization or not. What they care is that they're getting something they need. Okay? So go find one or two of those projects in your backlog and figure out how you can use data virtualization to solve those. 
Right? And eventually, you'll be off and running, and three years down the road, you'll have your own data, you'll have your own logical data warehouse beginnings right as the logical data warehouse is emerging as the best practice for data management. It will be there. It's happening. It's, it's, it's been a long road for composite software. We've been doing this for 10 years, and we're so excited that it's, that it's happening. So this is your time, and this is what's different about now. Okay. So I'd be happy to take questions, and then we can all go and uh, share a cocktail together. Suresh, uh, what about the the cloud data? You are, you are talking about that you know the data stored in the cloud, and uh, it's better to keep keep the data over there. So now having the cloud data it's sitting in different data center, uh, composite coming in, do, trying to do the logical data warehouse. So how the ne network latency? You now you are moving the data from one 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 cloud to another cloud. Is there anything on the road on, on the on the path? that is going to solve this latency on network side? Right, good question. Uh, network latencies, essentially, right? Because now that you have data in multiple places uh, that happen to be on the WAN, in the cloud, uh, latency can become an issue. Um, we actually already have quite a bit of technology that can help with this latency through our caching mechanisms. And um, we work with um, several companies who have essentially edge caching uh, associated with their data virtualization implementations so that data that's either across the pond in London or in a cloud-based uh, 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 infra infrastructure, they can cache whatever, they data, whatever data they need locally and they can incrementally update that cache to keep it in sync so that they can do whatever visibility and reporting they need. So over time, this hybrid architecture between the data lives somewhere but it's visiting here is, is what you're going to see as kind of the normal. Um, and so caching becomes a big part of solving that latency problem. And, and this is worth saying, by the way, just about performance in general, both latency and network bandwidth, is um, one of the big concerns people have about data virtualization is it's never going to perform because you're moving too much data at runtime. And our answer to that is if your use case requires you to move that much data in runtime, you're right. We can't violate the laws of physics. So our goal with optimization is to reduce the amount of data that needs to be moved at runtime, push as much work down to those underlying systems, and then do the right join algorithms in the right order, maybe move some data around so that you don't have to move that much data in runtime. If at the end of the day, you still have to move more data at runtime than you want to to meet your SLA, that's what caching's for. That may be what ETL can solve. But the point is your users don't have to care. Right? It's underneath that veil. It's behind the little food door that uh, Rick Vanderlands showed. Okay. Yes. Uh, Son, right? Okay. You mentioned for the uh, the energy client, you had a ca uh, cache data from comp was it from composite or was it from I mean composite to Natiza or was it from direct sources into Natiza? From data sources into Natiza. Okay. Uh, they actually also have. Natiza data sources, but they just happen to use Natiza also as their cache target. And, and one of the reasons they do that, by the way, is if you think about caching data, you're uh, dynamically materializing data and you're probably doing it over and over again because the data is volatile and, and so you want to keep your cache updated. Uh, one of the nice things about these MPP platforms is they have much less requirement to do tuning, right? Uh, you don't have to sort of create indexes ahead of time. You don't have to go create table spaces ahead of time. You can just toss the data in there, and the next query you run performs. And so that's why an MPP type source is a really interesting place to do caching, uh, is because you can do dynamic caching in there, and it will perform when Composite goes to access that data. Hi, I'm Sri Tirumala from Qualcomm. I have a comment and a question. So uh, some of the you know, uh, performance issues or infrastructure things. I think it's good to engage with the experts in that field, whether it's networking or latency, et cetera. And then, I mean, but the fundamentally, you have to buy into data virtualization and you have to see value in that. And, and there's a lot of value in, uh, you know, from our experience at Qualcomm, the numbers are pretty old. We've now more than 36 projects in three years, <laughs> so to speak. And, My slides you know, are out of date. I needed yeah, to yeah. virtualize them. <laughs> <laughs> 
Same, same pace, yeah, exactly, yeah. same pace, same, maybe even faster. So, uh, you know, so those problems are there, you, whether it's Netiza, et cetera, you can solve those infrastructure problems, but that doesn't slow adoption of data virtualization. That's my comment. My question is, in your roadmap, do you see value for, you know, query virtualizing, query optimization itself? Like, you know, there is some thought leadership about whether, you know, you figure out these are, this is the query and then you say, hey, it's best run in uh, the underlying data source right from the virtualization layer, it, say, it figures out and say, hey, you know what, maybe this query can be run in the underlying EDW or Oracle yep. or Hadoop. That's, uh, a, that's yeah. a really good question, and, and I actually should have covered that as part of the uh, EDW overlay that I was doing, because that's something that um, we do believe that uh, what we call adaptive uh, query processing and adaptive data access will be something part of a logical data warehouse. It's not natively part of data virtualization today. Um, we, uh, we, we do dynamic planning of the queries, but once we do that dynamic planning, it's usually very explicit as to where the data is coming from. As, as we move uh, down the roadmap and we go to uh, more towards the logical data warehouse, we do see the idea that um, data could be available from multiple different places, and your policies may decide which place you get that data from. Some of it may be aggregated, some of it may be raw, and it could depend on the query style as to which one you go after. Right? So, so that, those are kind of, those, that's functionality that's definitely on our roadmap as we zero in on the logical data warehouse. Thank you. Hi, Sumante Basu from Citigroup. Um, uh, in a typical financial industry or any regulatory industry, we do a lot of reporting to the regulators, as well as we do a lot of analytical reporting and uh, financial reporting to management and other places. So does this solution support the taxonomies that are required by the different regulatory bodies, different line of lines of business to combine together and mapping the data concepts or vocabularies that exist in different lines of business as well as different industry groups right. to combine to maybe single canonical model um, across the enterprise? Yep, good question. Um, and, and just like in the financial industry and the pharmaceutical industry, they have similar data structures um, for doing reporting and compliance to the FDA. Um, and so the question is, can this help with that part of the problem um, where you have to create uh, essentially data sets for submission to regulatory agencies or even uh, partners um, that don't necessarily match your underlying uh, physical manifestation of that data. Uh, and the answer is absolutely. And in fact, our customers today do that both in finance and in pharmaceuticals and in energy because they have these uh, compliance requirements. Now, when you uh, when I drew that picture of the energy company where they had these business canonicals in the middle that they've defined, maybe there's uh, uh, 500 of them, maybe your business has 300, maybe your business has 1,200, whatever it is, these are your definitions for how you want to run your business. And now this federal agency comes along and says, yeah, but I want it in this format. Okay? So above those canonicals, you can then do some mapping directly into whatever format they want you to submit in. And you can import those formats into the data virtualization layer and then wire them up. And what's nice about that is you continue to get to work in the canonicals that you want as part of your business, but you can very easily map that and reform that into the reporting requirements without doing anything physical. And what's nice about this is in the data virtualization layer, you might have, I think you heard uh, multiple customers today describe that they have four or five layers of views, and this top layer, which is the mapping to, you know, say, uh, uh, FPML or CDISC in pharmaceuticals, um, that top layer is just a light mapping layer on top of the business canonical layer. When a query comes in for data, our optimizer collapses that whole thing and optimizes the whole set of layers as one. So you're not penalized by having multiple <coughs> virtual layers in your virtualization system. Right? That's a really compelling concept because if you think about that in traditional data management, you end up having uh, operational data stores that then feed data marts and data warehouses that then go to derivative data marts and each one of these becomes a physical layer that has costs to it. But in the virtual implementation of this, uh, you actually get to do as many layers as you want and you don't pay a penalty for it 
um, other than the complexity you might create. But there's a middle ground. There's a, there's a happy medium there where you end up with somewhere between three and six layers of views that help you actually manage things more efficiently. Let's do one more. Yeah. So the, uh, there was a top layer in the uh, logical data warehouse that was about uh, taxonomy. And uh, you mentioned that that was the business view catalog. And uh, is that part of composite roadmap, or is that how, 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 is it how is it going to be implemented by composite? Right. Uh, good question. And actually, um, I should also, as part of answering this, talk a little bit about semantics um, uh, and, and where they fit um, relative to our roadmap. So uh, business view catalog, self-service business browsing of data assets. Is that part of our roadmap? Absolutely. We believe that that's an important part of what a full-fledged logical data warehouse will encompass, and we will absolutely be creating that. I can't tell you right now when. Um, we've got a lot on our plate in a lot of various areas, but that's absolutely part of our roadmap, and we think it's an important part of um, self-service, governance, uh, data stewardship, and just the ability to leverage your information assets. Okay? Um, I should also mention, sometimes that top layer is labeled semantics. Um, and I, I just want to make clear here that there will be a, a line above which we probably will not go, where you have traditional semantics, meaning OWL, RDF, uh, meaning graphs, those sorts of things. That generally tends to be above the data virtualization, data logical data warehouse layer, um, even though sometimes people call that business view layer a semantic layer. Right? And in fact, um, you'll see the term semantic layer being applied to this business catalog. Um, so that kind of semantic layer absolutely is within our scope. The sort of data mapping and meaning um, uh, between concepts and uh, kind of the, the more theoretical semantics that you're seeing, that generally sits above that catalog. Okay. Also, if you recall on the Comcast presentation, they've built that yep. catalog now already yep. with uh, services. Mm -hmm. One final question. Does that semantic layer replace or work with a corporate glossary, business glossary, which will contain far more right. than what's so, in there? Yeah, so uh, I, I think, so the question is, does that semantic layer, that business catalog that I'm talking about, replace a corporate data catalog that you might be working on, a, a business glossary that you may be working on today? Um, I never like to use the word replace because um, generally these things are complementary. Um, I believe that, it, that those, the concepts of a business glossary are very much aligned with the concept of a business view catalog, and whether they end up in the same system or cooperating with one another I think remains to be seen. Um, we have very large customer today who has a business view catalog, the only reason I say this is it's on my mind, they have a business view catalog um, project underway already, but they're uh, acquiring data virtualization in order to help implement that catalog. So, so I think it depends on, on the tools you want to use and how you want to curate that. But ultimately, the implementation of the runtime of those views will sit inside the logical data warehouse or inside of data virtualization. <laughs>